So uh, tonight, uh, this afternoon, if you want to go with me first to, um, let's start, let's start in the book of Timothy. So first Timothy chapter one. Now, I want you to see a thread throughout the Word. You're going to see a thread of the similar thing here throughout the Word. I shared a little of this in February, and we'll see how hungry you guys are this afternoon, and (laughs) and we'll just kind of go from it uh, from here. But 1 Timothy uh, chapter 1, verse 5. Now, the purpose of the commandment is this. Uh, Come on, work with me here. So now the purpose of the commandment is this, love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, whoops, Um. and then he says, and from sincere faith, okay? Then he says, from which some have strayed and turned to idle talk. Now you'll notice this combination, if you look up here, you will see these two combined again and again throughout the New Testament. Where you see one, you will see other. Where you see the other, you will see the one. Okay? You will always see these two somehow, somewhere in the Scriptures come together. And so here, it starts off. Now, Paul is training Timothy, who's a young pastor. He's a church planter as well. He's training Titus. And so here is Paul is training him. Now, he jumps into the latter part of chapter 1, and it says in verse 18, This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage a good warfare. Now, that's another whole subject. But having faith and what? Good conscience. Ah, they're together again, aren't they? Which some, having uh, rejected concerning the faith, have suffered, suffered shipwreck. So here we see conscience married together again within two verses of each other uh, uh, with the word faith, okay? Now as you go over to chapter 2, 1 Timothy 2, can I give you a word workout this morning? Is that okay? Okay. So here it says in um, chapter 3, excuse me, chapter 3, verse 9, holding the mystery of faith, and a pure conscience. So now that's three chapters. Three times Paul says the same thing. And now we go into chapter 4. In chapter 4, verse 1, now the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times, some will depart from faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own what? Conscience seared with a hot iron. There it is again. Now, as you keep going, go over to uh, 2 Timothy. Look in 2 Timothy. So 2 Timothy, Paul says in verse 3, chapter 1, verse 3. Here he says, I thank God, whom I serve, with a pure conscience... As my forefathers did, and without ceasing, I remember you in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see you and being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the genuine what faith that is in you that was once dwelt in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, I'm persuaded is in you also. Therefore, I remind you, stir up the gift of God that is in you by the laying on of my hands. But here he is pairing together those, those words again, conscience and faith. So if your faith is not working, that means somewhere you're not obedient to your conscience. <laughs> Look at your neighbor and say, I think he's talking about you. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. So if your faith is not working, the problem is that you're not being obedient to your conscience. Because obedience to the conscience is 
necessary for your faith to function. Okay? Now I'm going to show you some scriptures that'll that'll validate that later on here in a, in a few minutes. But but I just wanted to kind of get some training wheels, okay? So these are training wheels. We're talking about hearing God's voice, okay? So these are some training wheels in, in hearing God's voice, okay? Is obedience to your conscience. So the more obedient you are to your conscience, the more, the sharper, I should say, the voice of God comes to you. Because if you won't obey him in a little thing, then you'll never obey him in the big thing. Right? So if you won't be obedient in, in, in the little thing. So sometimes what the Lord does is he just gives little tests. It's like little tests to see if you'll be obedient. Right? And so do you pass the childlike test? Right? So sometimes it's small. Sometimes it's like call that person. Sometimes it's buy that person lunch. Right? Whatever. whatever. I mean, it, it might be, you know, buy that person's gas. Tell them Jesus loves them. Right? Might be give that guy twenty bucks. Come on, right? Yeah, who knows? It might be just you know write someone a note on social media and just tell them that God really thinks that they're phenomenal, right? And so it's just that simple obedience thing. We all hear it all the time, right? We all hear that little voice, and many people think of the conscience only regarding what not to do, but sometimes it's in learning what to do as well, right? So, I mean, sometimes the con your conscience will burn because, ah, I shouldn't have said that. I said something stupid. How many of you ever said something stupid, right? Okay. How many of you aren't going to raise your hands no matter what I say, right? Okay. <laughs> okay. So, so sometimes it's not what you are doing that's wrong, but sometimes it's what you're not doing. It's the sin of neglect, more the sin, of, uh, uh, the sin of omission more than the sin of commission, some people call it, right? And so that's why there's something about being obedience in your conscience. Even when it just seems like don't, you know, my flesh doesn't want me to do it, right? Whatever it might be, but there's just that simplicity in it. I'll tell you a, a, a funny story that um, um, we, we went and we were ministering in a church in, in Wisconsin, and, and uh, we were in these revival meetings, and I was supposed to be there three days and ended up staying there for a month. I was there about five weeks. And so uh, the, the meetings just kept extending. And so I was ministering in this church, and we had all kinds of crazy miracles. We had one dude who came in a wheelchair, and he had a, uh, what do they call that, a tracheotomy. And in the middle of the service while I was preaching, he pulls the tracheotomy out, and he was totally healed. He literally pulled it out by himself. I'm like, Jesus, thank you, Father. I didn't do it, you know? <laughs> Holy cow. Boy, that'll clear your sinuses out real quick, right? And, uh, but, so in these meetings, as I, I used to bring with me my guitar, and I would always play with the band, and I would always do worship just to kind of keep sharp. I'm very average with keyboard and guitar. I'm nowhere near what, what he is, but... And so, anyway, so I had my guitar. I had this beautiful rosewood guitar, uh, rosewood and mother of pearl inlay. It was a pretty guitar. And, and so um, I'm up with the band, and I'm, I'm doing worship. And so as I'm playing and I'm doing worship, I have my eyes shut. And I open my eyes as I'm playing, and my eyes fall on the young man in the last row. And this young man in the last row, as my eyes fall on the young man in the last row, the Holy Spirit says, at the end of the service, give that young man your guitar. That's what my conscience said. <laughs> I, I wanted to just close my eyes and say, Lord, I love you. <laughs> la, 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 la. I didn't hear that. <laughs> but I heard that prompting, right? And I'm like, I closed my eyes and I'm like, God, he doesn't need the guitar. I need the guitar, you know? And then God spoke, spoke to me and he says, you have a greater need to give it than even he has to receive it. So I said, all right, I just had bought a $140 or $150 uh, hard shell case. <laughs> I mean, it still had the stickers on it and everything. And so I'm like, wow, you know, for the airplane and stuff. And so at the end of the service, I just, uh, I went and I turned aside. And as I turned aside, I went to go put the guitar in the case. <laughs> I don't know, maybe I was hoping he'd go home or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so I put the guitar in the case, and as I put the guitar in the case, I turn around, and he's walking up to me. 
He goes, man, that's the most beautiful guitar I've ever seen. I just had to come tell you that. I wanted to slap him. Excuse me. <laughs> and, but before I could think, I responded to my conscience. I said, be blessed in the name of Jesus. And I handed him the guitar, and he just instantly, it looked like I hit him in the solar plexus, and he just burst out crying, what, you know? And he had just given testimony that he had been free of drugs for 12 months. And so that night he had brought his, his uh, unsaved brother who was struggling in homosexuality and his mom there to the service, and, and his brother was not a Christian. But the moment I sewed that guitar into the, into the brother, the power of God not only hit him, but hit the mother and the son, and the son got born again in the service. Come on, somebody. So, so then I went, and, and after this period of time, I went and, uh, you know, I, I went home, and, and so I had uh, um, a Thursday night open, and so I went to go to my home church to, uh, just to receive. It was a prayer night. And so I went with my Bible, and I walk into the church. It's just prayer night, and so I've just got my baseball hat on. And so I walk into the church, and the secretary of the church, no one knows that I go to this particular church. And so I, as I walk into the church, the tech, secretary said, oh, she said, Tom Scarella. She said, I haven't seen you in, in a couple of months. And I said, yeah, I've been, you know, Wisconsin, and I've been over here in Virginia and blah, 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 blah. And so uh, she said, um, uh, she said, oh, it's good to see you. But she said, I have something for you. I said, for me? And she said, yeah. She said, someone came and give you something. I said, well, nobody knows I go to this church. She goes, I don't even know who the guy is. She goes, just come over here. It's, it, it, and so she goes and she reaches behind her desk and she pulls out a $5,000 Taylor guitar. <laughs> <laughs> The guitar I had sewn was 500 about $500, but the one I had received and reaped was 5000 literally 10 times as much. And so, but it was that obedience thing. The Lord began to speak to me and said, I looked to see what you would do with this before I would give you the other. Because I asked her, I said, what day did he give it? And it was literally the next day for my obedience. So I say it like this, obedience brings blessing, Right? So there's something about just being simply obedient and just doing it, even when it looks stupid. <laughs> Come on, right? Just that simple obedience, that simple obedience, just that simple obedience in just obeying the voice of your conscience. And the moment that you're, you're willing to be obedient in the little, it's like God begins to trust you with more, right? And so it, it always begins small, always in, in hearing the voice of God, always, oh, what did I do here? I killed it. So it always begins small. There it comes. All right. I'll figure it out. And so uh, come on here. Work with me. Technology. Uh. <laughs> it's saying to me, may, I'm trying to make sure it's you. Well, yeah, I'm trying to make sure it's you as well. Okay. So... Uh, I want to get back to this thing with, with obedience. So in this thing with obedience, that the moment you begin to be faithful with that little thing, it begins to grow into something greater. Okay. So go over to, uh, let me see if I can find that scripture. Um, I wrote it down here. Okay. So 1 Samuel. Go to 1 Samuel. You all okay this afternoon? Is this okay? Okay. So 1 Samuel 16. 1 Samuel 16. Zach here? <laughs> That's all right. I don't know. Do you know how to do this? All right. I'm trying to put the password in. Oh, there it comes. Duh. Okay. So 1 Samuel 16 says, now, uh, now the Lord said to Samuel, how long 
Will you mourn for Saul, seeing I've rejected him from reigning over Israel? Then he says, fill your horn with oil. Now, here's a side thought, okay? If you're a student of the word, you'll catch this. All right, there you are. Hey, man. Ah, you got, got me in. I think it's just connect on the bottom. Okay, so, um, so here he begins to talk about fill your horn with oil. But previously, when Samuel went and anointed Saul, the Bible says that he, he filled a flask. But a flask is a man-made thing. A natural thing. That was filled. But now God says, fill your horn with oil, right? So in other words, something that's not man-made. I want you to fill your horn with oil. And I'm sending you to the house of Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. Okay? So then as you keep on going here, then it says this. Um, Then it goes on to say, uh, without reading all of it, Okay, verse 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as a man sees. For man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks at the the heart, right? Okay, so now we see this. Now, without reading the whole story, if you read the whole story, you'll notice the sons of Jesse came before the prophet Samuel. Now, The word Samuel means, does anyone know what it means? He will hear the Lord. That's what it means. He will hear the Lord. So he will hear the Lord uh, is the prophet here, and he is looking to anoint one of the sons of Jesse to become king over Israel. Now, he brings the first son. God doesn't say, no, dummy. It's David out in the field. How many of you notice that? He made all of the sons pass before him, and he kept saying, nope, 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 nope. And then he says this verse I just read to you, verse 7. He says, God doesn't look like a man looks. He looks at the heart. And he says, do you have another son? Yes, I have another son, but he's in the field tending to the sheep. He smells like sheep, right? Okay, so yeah, go get him, for the Lord's going to anoint that one, right? And so it was the least likely one. Now, no. A lot of times in hearing God's voice, God will tell you what something is not before he will tell you what it is. So God will tell you a lot of times what something is not before he will tell you what something is. Okay? Many times you'll hear a check in your spirit. Nope, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. And that's exactly what happened here with Samuel is God just kept saying no. no. I mean, wouldn't it have been a lot easier if God just said right from the beginning, David? You know, but that's not how the Lord did it. And that's how the Lord does it with you and I. Often he will just often just have certain things begin to take place and you're trying to be led of the Spirit and you'll hear, nope, 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 do that. Right? And so often that's what happens is with the Holy Spirit in leading you and in ministering through you, okay? So back to the beginning here uh, where we were before is, you know, we're working with training wheels. And so working with training wheels, this is where your faith begins to work. Your faith is by obedience, uh, is operates better with obedience to the conscience. Now, go over to the uh, first, um, I think it's first John. I told you I'm giving you a word workout. 1 John 3. So 1 John 3. <clears throat> now, when the, when the translators... In 1611, King James translated this. You have to understand, English, number one, was different back then. And two, that sometimes their religion got in the way of understanding a word to translate. What I mean by that, this is a great example of 1 John 3. They didn't understand what God was saying, so they tried to change it to sound with what they thought he was saying. And I'll show you exactly where. Verse 18. 1 John 3, 18, my little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. 
And by this we know that we are of the truth and assure our hearts before him. Now the word hearts there is actually the word conscience. Okay? Now I said this in February, but I'll say it again. Is the word conscience is never mentioned in the first 39 books of the Old Testament. Never. Because is that that was natural man worshiping God in a natural way. Outer court, inner court, holy of holies. Come on, right? We don't worship God like that anymore. In the New Testament, now we by faith come boldly to the throne. Right? So I don't go past the outer court and through the holy place. I know I'm ruining a song, but, <laughs> but we don't come that way anymore. Come on, right? Unless you're going to bring with you a goat or a lamb to slaughter before him, that's not how you do it anymore. Come on, somebody, right? So it's a cute song, but it's unbiblical. <laughs> okay? <clears throat> but so now the way that we come before him in, in the New Covenant, in the New Testament, is we come by faith directly to the throne. We have full access. Oh, man, I'm going to try this church over here. I think these guys are asleep over here. We have full access. Come on. Okay. So we have full access to the throne of grace, right? God's holding nothing back from us, right? Nothing at all. So here, instead of using the word heart, every time you see the word heart, just in these verses, I want you to translate it to the word conscience, okay? So when we go through this and we read this, it'll, it'll make sense to you. So, so just pause that thought for a second, and let's go back to where I was. So 39 books of the Bible, nothing about the conscience. Not until James, excuse me, John chapter 8, when John 8 comes along and Jesus sees the woman caught in adultery, that's the first time the Bible mentions the word conscience, ever. Because now he's beginning to speak to people that are being spiritual, right? And so that's the first time that we see it. Okay, so now fast forward here to 1 John chapter 3. In, in verse 20 it says, For if our, what? Conscience condemns us, God is greater than our conscience, and he knows all things, right? Beloved, if our conscience does not condemn us, we have, ah, we got confidence. Look up here. So now he says, listen, you have confidence. If your conscience is not condemning you, you have total confidence. And then he goes on to say this. He says, uh, uh, if our conscience does not condemn us, we have confidence towards God. And what? Now here comes the blank check. And whatever. Everyone shout whatever. whatever. Okay, he says whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Right? So when does whatever happen? Whatever happens when our conscience doesn't condemn us. If there's, conf if, if there's a condemning conscience then you have, no you have no confidence, and your faith will not work. Your faith will not work because you do not have confidence. Come on, right? But God says, if you have confidence, then your, your excuse me, if your conscience is clean, right? If your conscience is clean before the Lord, then he says, listen, you have total, complete confidence. So how do I clean my conscience? I never thought you'd ask Okay, so Hebrews chapter, um, I think it's chapter 8, talks about this. So now I'm going to say some controversial stuff. So don't hold Pastor Vitali to this, all right? You blame me. <laughs> okay? So in Hebrews chapter... Um, not 8, chapter 9, there it is. Verse 8 says, The Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was standing. Okay? The way into the holiest of all was not made available. Right? God, so here God is saying, listen, the Holy, is, Holy Spirit is in. Now, if you don't have this verse starred and sig circled or something, do that. Verse 8 is absolutely critical. He says, listen, the Holy Spirit, I'm in chapter 9, verse 8. The Holy Spirit's indicating this. The way into the holiest of all wasn't made available yet 
or was it made manifest while the first tabernacle was standing? This is why Jesus said, every stone must be broken down from this. Not one stone is going to be left upon another of this temple. No longer will you worship natural. I'm only going to connect with you in spirit. So they that worship must worship what? Ah, yeah. So you couldn't do that before through the old natural way because that was for carnal, natural, hard-hearted man. Okay? But now in the new covenant, he says, now that way is made open. Verse 9 says, it was symbolic. It was what? It was symbolic for the present time that both offer gifts and sacrifices offered, which cannot, it cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the? conscience concerned only with foods and drinks and various washings fleshy ordinances gosh i think i've been to that church and (laughs) imposed into the time of reformation but christ came as a high priest of the good things to come of the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands that uh not of this creation not with the blood of bulls and of goats But with his own blood, he entered into the most holy place once and for all and obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer, uh, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, through the eternal spirit, come on, offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Right? Everyone say, cleanse your conscience. So, according to the scripture, um, hey, Zach, I like this thing, man. This is great. Okay. So, um, so here he, he uses this word. So, here he says, listen, this conscience thing, it needs to be cleansed. Right? But the only way it's cleansed is by the blood of Jesus. Right? So this is what he's saying. He says, listen, the the blood of Jesus is the only thing that can do it. Now, if you go over to chapter 10, it says, For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, not the very image of the things, can never with... Now, here Paul's saying the same thing can never with those same sacrifices which offered continually year after year make those who approach perfect, or a better word is mature. It can never bring spiritual maturity. Verse 2, for then they would not have ceased to be offered, for the worshipers once purified would have no more consciousness, come on, of what? Of sin, right? inferring this even though they would offer and slaughter the blood would run still they had a conscience a consciousness of sin so they had no confidence towards god come on right and so so as we keep on going here uh it goes on to say for uh, the uh, uh, uh for if those sac- and those sacrifices there's a remainder a reminder of sins every year right and uh uh ba 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 Yeah, so we could keep on going. Verse 9 says, uh, Behold, I come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second, right? So here's a mindset he's coming with. Now, why do I bring all of this up regarding the voice of God? Well, all of this is completely relevant because that when somebody comes with that old covenant mindset, they always are conscious of their sins. They're not conscious of, of their righteousness in Christ. They're terrified to say I'm righteous in Christ. Terrified. I've seen believers are like, if if I stand up and say I'm as righteous as I am today as I'll be in heaven. They're like, oh my God, don't say that. (laughs) They're like afraid the devil's out going to come and jump on them or something. I don't know what it is, right? It's because they're so used to that fear-driven, come on somebody, that fear-driven, manipulative, religious crap that never brings deliverance. Come on, somebody, right? And it never cleanses your conscience. You still feel as bad as you did before, right? But here God says this. Listen, it's gone. All by one thing, the blood of Jesus. 
And this is why in our country right now we have a battle over this subject more than almost anything else. This is why these seeker-sensitive churches are throwing the cross out of the church. They're getting the cross out of the church. No songs about the blood anymore. Don't sing about the blood. Don't talk about the blood. Just talk about your best life now. Just talk about how God, you know, wants to do whatever. Come on, somebody, right? And so it's just nothing but a self-help gospel instead of something that cleanses the conscience. This is why the old timers used to sing about the blood. They'd preach about the blood. They'd pray the blood. Come on, somebody. Because they knew there was a cleansing of the conscious of their sins, right? And so as a result of it, it was delivering them of that consciousness, that repeated consciousness of sin. So now many of these seeker-sensitive churches in, in America, in Portland or wherever you're from, what do they do? Now, they don't want to talk about the blood, but they want to appease people's consciences. So what they do is they emphasize worship. What did worship do with Saul when he wanted to kill David? It appeased that conscience just long enough, but once the note stopped, bam, the guilt came right back. Is that right? And then Saul wanted to kill David right after that. And that's exactly what is perpetrated week after week in church. Man, if you go to a seeker-sensitive church, run. Okay? I mean, I've heard some people say, well, we're not sure, but we think possibly our pastor is filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm like, how dumb can you get and still breathe? I mean, my Lord, what do you go into that thing for? What do you go to a rotary club or something? I mean, that's not a church. Because the body only grows as, as high as the head. Come on, somebody, right? So if the head is dead, guess what happens to the body? The whole body will die, right? And so, yeah, anyways. Jesus, set me free. So that's why we need to focus and we need to emphasize the blood, right? Because it brings a, an, um, a cleansing of the conscience. So praise God. But these are, these are some training wheels that can jumpstart you in hearing God's voice in just those simple obedient things, just in those little things, those little nudges of the Spirit. When the Spirit of God begins to just nudge your heart and just doing something simple. It sounds silly. Why, why am I doing this? I don't know. It's just an obedient thing, right? And just in those simple things, sometimes it may go against your religious brain. Get delivered of it, <laughs> right? And so sometimes, it, whatever it might be, you know, it, it just delivers people. And uh, I remember we were, we were in Germany. We were ministering in Germany, Dusseldorf. And uh, Susie and I, we, we did some street ministry as well. We ministered in these churches, and then we also went on the street, and we took people on the street. And uh, so uh, I told Susie, I said, I'm going to take a group over here. We're going to minister to people, and you go over there. So she had the pastor and his group with them. And so she went over to a bunch of crazy skinheads. And so she found these skinheads, right? And this one main guy, here he is, this main skinhead guy, he was... Uh, he had girls all over him, and, and he was smoking and drinking and carrying on and stuff and cursing. And, and she walks straight up to the main guy, and she walks straight into this group. And, and through the interpreter, she was speaking to him. Well, he understood English. And the moment she started talking about Jesus, whew, his conscience. And so the guy is looking around. Where do I put this bottle in this? And so Susie says, what, what, what's, what's wrong? She knew it was wrong, but she wanted him to acknowledge, oh, we're talking about God. I got to put this stuff down, you know. And so Susie said, here, I'll hold it for you. And so she <laughs> held his beer and held it. She goes, oh, I used to smoke these too, you know. And he's like, what? I mean, he was blown away that she did that. She said, oh, yeah, your sin can't jump off on me. It has no power over my, the righteousness of Christ that lives in me. Come on, somebody. Amen. And just that simple thing, that guy went and gave his life to Jesus. The whole group of them, tons of them got born again. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Hallelujah. So the first training wheel is really obedience to your conscience. That's simple, just obedience, just simple obedience to your conscience. Another one we kind of touched on this morning is uh, uh, praying in tongues and interpreting it. Okay, ah. so 
Now, this one thing kind of throws some people off regarding interpretation of tongues. Now, it's not a translation. It's an interpretation, right? So if I was speaking up here this morning and, and our friends from Germany back there, he was getting interpreted to, right? Okay? He wasn't getting a translation. He was just getting an interpretation. What's the difference? Well, there's a big difference. A translation is word by word what you're saying. Interpretation is this is basically what you're saying. You understand? This is the just of what you are saying. That's why some person can give a tongue that may be five minutes long, and the interpretation is like three sentences. It's an interpretation. It's not a translation. It's an interpret. This is what God is saying. Boom. Amen? And so that's the difference between the two. And so you can, by faith, you can begin to pray in tongues. And as you pray in tongues, you can interpret. Some people are like, I can't do that. Well, I just say, how do you pray in tongues? Oh, I just do it by faith. Oh, well, guess what? <laughs> this is not rocket science. Guess how you're going to interpret it? By faith. Right? I mean, the first time you prayed in tongues, were you a little bit nervous about it? Come on, right? But you did it, and as you just did it by faith, it began to come, and a confidence began to come, and it, you grew in confidence in it. But it's the exact same thing regarding interpretation. I think some people are waiting for this massive voice from heaven, you know? I mean, in my whole Christian life, I've heard the audible voice of God twice in my whole life. So I don't live by that. I live by learning to actively every day just hear God's voice, right? And, and so the simplicity of it, and keep it simple, right? Okay? Um, yeah, so, um, you know, there's something simple about it. And in fact, sometimes it almost feels like you're making it up. Now, Pastor Curry was talking about Cor Cor Corbus. Uh, Curry, you've never heard this story probably, unless you heard me tell it one other time, Okay? So the first time I went to South Africa was 2006. So I go in 2006. I had been watching this guy on YouTube for years. Uh, well, not just YouTube, but on the Internet for years. And uh, I'd seen these crazy miracles, and, and he was connected to somebody who was very, you know, controversial. And so I'm like, you know. And, and so long story short, we ended up getting invited there to minister. And so we ministered there. And then after one of the sessions, he said, come, I want to take you to, he said, we don't live that close to, um, uh, what's the giant park called there again? Um, Kruger, yeah. And so um, he said, this is not Kruger, but he said, this is a lion park in our town. And so we want to take you to this lion park. I said, okay. So we're walking around the lion park. So as we're walking around the lion park, now only Curry will understand because he was a kind of a funky guy. So we're walking around this lion park, and uh, <laughs> all of a sudden his cell phone goes off. So, I mean, it's just us and these lions, so, and there's no out outside noise. So I'm not eavesdropping, but you can hear the whole conversation. You know, how many of you know what I'm saying, right? And so, so we're walking, his cell phone goes off, and I hear this woman screaming. And this is why I hear her screaming and crying, please, my, she said, prophet, please pray. My, my daughter and my son-in-law went on a boat off the coast of uh, Cape Town. And if you don't know this, they're the most violent seas in the world. And it's where the Indian Ocean connects with the Atlantic Ocean. And, and it literally will snap a ship in half. And so they thought it was an, an average day, but what they call a rogue wave came and literally blew the vessel in half. And they sank in less than three minutes in shark-infested waters, great white shark-infested waters. And so, but they had a chance to call out Mayday. They were going down. Literally, the ship just snapped in half from this rogue wave. And uh, she said, they have already sent out what we would call the Coast Guard, and the Coast Guard has gone out there with a helicopter, and there is nothing to find. There's no ship. There's no bodies. There's no nothing. Will you pray? And he said, I don't need to pray. He said, this is what God says. Tell them to go back to the first place that they look. They'll see them hanging onto the front bow of the ship, and no one will have died. And so he hangs up the phone, 
And he's like, so, isn't this a cool-looking lion deer? I'm like, no, 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 no. You don't, like, downshift from, like, great white sharks, Atlantic Ocean, ship blown in half to a lion, okay? I don't, like, downshift that quick. I'm like, what the heck happened? And I said, uh, did God just tell you to say that? Now, now I'm going to freak you out. I'm going to freak your religion out a little bit here, all right? And he said, no. And it, because it, there's a little difference with some of the Afrikaans and, and some of the culture differences and stuff. And this is what he said. This is going to sound crazy to you. But he goes, no, I made it up. I just said it. That's how he said it. He said, I just said it. I'm like, what? God didn't tell you that? Nope, I just said it. And God agrees with me. <laughs> and so we're walking. We're walking. A half hour goes by, and the phone rings again. And it's this, did I ever tell you this? I didn't know if I did. The phone rings again. It's the same woman. Now she's crying. She said they sent them back to the same spot where they first went. There they were, hanging on the bow of the ship, and the sharks were circling them. But she said none of them had suffered harm. Come on, somebody. Amen? So it was then that I really caught a revelation of that there's even different kinds of prophecy. Now, I know I'm throwing a lot at you. I shouldn't have done that. I probably should have saved this for tomorrow. But I call it, here's what I call it, okay? I just call it this. Oh, I shouldn't have done that. Anyways, uh, <laughs> I call it two kinds of prophecy. Okay, so here's prophecy. I call it, um, whoops, vertical. I can't write. And horizontal. Now you may say, what in the world is that? Well, without doing a whole message on it, just kind of the just of it is this, is many times we think in terms of prophecy as only God speaks horizontal, excuse me, uh, uh, vertically to me, then I tell you what God says. But what if I could show you scriptures that you say it and God says, amen, I agree with him. So they're both prophecy, come on but they're just in a different way. It's not, you may call it confession, whatever, you, whatever word you may want to use. But in other words, you are decreeing something. God says, amen, I agree. I'll give you a great example. We, were, uh, we used to live in Florida, and uh, three years ago we moved back to Minnesota. But I was ministering in Minnesota <laughs> in uh, January. I don't know what I was thinking. And <laughs> not a good thing at 20 below zero. And uh, so we were ministering in this uh, a church. We were doing like a week long uh, over um, New Year's Day. And, um, and so I grew up in that town. I grew up in St. Paul, Minnesota. And so um, as it's a blizzard outside, I'm like, God, I can't wait to get back to Florida. Oh, my gosh. And so I'm gathering my books and stuff. And so I'm wheeling my, my book table to the door. And this woman comes in from the blizzard outside, and she says, oh, I came to pick someone up. And uh, so she starts talking to this lady, and then she kind of double looks at me, and she goes, I know you. You're Tom Scarella. I'm like, sure, yeah, hi, how are you, you know? And she says, you don't remember me? And I said, no. She goes, uh, we went to Bible school together 30 years ago. I'm like, wow, thanks for making me feel old. I feel so much better. Thank you so much, you know? And... Um, so she says, uh, we went to Bible school. You don't remember me. I didn't remember her. And so, um, so as she's talking, I just said in my heart, I said, Lord, I haven't seen this woman in over 30 years. I said, God, give me a word for this woman. That's what I just said in my heart. So I just said to her, I said this. I, I even forget her name. I said, you know what? I said, God just thinks the world of you. And I began to prophesy to her. Uh, about um, various different things that she was struggling with in her life and inner fears and all of these different things and anxiety attacks and all of this stuff. And she just bursts out and starts crying. And she said, exactly true, exactly true. And so I start to pray for her, and she gets really set free there in the foyer of the church. 
And so I said to her, I said, because she says, is this going to come back to me? I said, no, it's never going to come back. And so I began to kind of share with her, if it does try to come back, then you just speak to it in the name of Jesus and stuff like that. And so I said, but I said, to prove to you that it won't come back, I said, let me just tell you this as a sign and a wonder. I said, your husband's in sales, right? And she's like, he is. How'd you know that? I said, well, God, he likes you. <laughs> and so I said, uh, he's in sales. And so she said, yes. And I said, um, your husband, um, I said, actually has got a resume filled out and ready to give to another company. She goes, he did. Last night he filled it out. She said, wow, this is crazy. And I said, now, now watch this. I said, for the next 30 days, I said, the month of January. Now, this is January 1st, okay? I said, for the month of January, for the next 30 days, your husband's going to be the number one salesman in the region. You're going to make more money in the next 30 days than you have in the last six months together. And she just starts weeping. She's like, you don't know. He's in sales, and it's been really tight, and blah, blah, blah. And so I said, but you tell your husband that's what I said, and that's what I prophesied. So she did. So she went home, told him, and I gave her our business card. So I, I get a call about um, three weeks later in our, our ministry line, and I get this call, and it's her husband. He's like, what happened to my wife? He's like, she's like a different woman. And so I'm like, really? I said, well, what? You know, and so he starts to say, you know, she used to be so fearful. She didn't like to go out in public and grocery shop or anything. And he says she's reading the Bible all the time. She's talking in that funny language all the time. <laughs> and he says she wants to go to church all the time. It's just crazy. And, and uh, but she told me what you told me that God said about me being the number one salesman in the region for the month of January. He goes, I went to work on January 2nd, and when I walked in, there were three people standing at my uh, chair waiting to buy a car, all three of them. He said, I didn't, have to sell, I didn't have to show them anything. He said, they just walked in, and I just filled them out. And he said, this has happened every day for three and a half weeks. I have three to five people waiting for me. And he said, the other salesmen are like, what's going on here? We're standing around here, and they're all going to your desk. Come on, somebody, right? So what, what happened there? That was both a vertical and a horizontal prophetic word. I, one, I heard from the Lord, but two, I spoke on behalf of God. And I said, this is what, what's going to happen. Kind of like what, what happened with Elijah. He said, it will not rain again, but according to my word. See you later. <laughs> Right? That's 1 Kings, right? So in 1 Kings, we know that that's what he did, 1 Kings 17, verse 1. And so Elijah walks up. Ah, it's, never gonna, it's not going to rain again until I tell you. Bye. And then he left. Well, what happened? It didn't rain again until he said again, right? And so what was that? That was a horizontal word. God agreed with that word, right, as a sign and a wonder. What happened with um, Ezekiel? He, God said, prophesy to the bones, Right? So it was a horizontal word. He prophesied to the bones, right? And uh, what, uh, what's another one? Um, Genesis chapter 33 with um, uh, Joseph. Remember Joseph? He was uh, working for his father-in-law who was crooked. What was his father-in-law's name again? No, 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 no. Joseph was working for his father-in-law. Jacob, excuse me. I said Joseph. I meant Jacob. Uh, yeah. Laban, yeah, Laban. And so um, Laban went and kept changing his pay. Remember that? And so then what was his recourse? What did he do? The Bible says he went and he got st these sticks, right? And the Bible says he set them up in front of natural animals. And they just came to drink. Uh, 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 right? They came to drink. And when the healthy ones came to drink, he put them in front of them. And when they gave birth, what did they give birth to? Spotted and speckled animals, right? And the Bible says he plundered Laban, right? So try to find in those verses that God told him to do that. God never told him to do that. He just did it, and God said, amen. I agree. Amen? Horizontal prophecy. Come on, right? 
And so he began to prophesy into natural wood that changed a natural cow and sheep and goats and all of these things. Come on, right? Genesis 33, look it up. And it changed something in their body so that they began to give birth to the spotted and speckled animals. That's what I mean by horizontal versus vertical, right? Okay? So, so we see different avenues, or it's not different avenues, but different kinds of, of prophecy. And, but I, this is what I've noticed is this over the years, is I kept waiting for God to do something, and God kept waiting for me. So it was a holy standoff. He's waiting for me, I'm waiting for him, right? And instead of waiting, initiate it, right? And the moment you initiate it, what happens is you begin to stir up uh, so to speak, those gifts of the Spirit, okay? Now, I got a little bit more time here, so let's do this. Go over to, I might as well open this up too because I'm kind of opening a can of worms, and then I'll kind of put it all together here as, as the weekend goes. But go over to the book of Romans, um, chapter 12. Can you go a few more minutes? Okay. So Romans, uh, excuse me, yeah, Romans chapter 12. So he starts off, he talks about renewing the mind, and then he gets all the way over uh, to verse 5. Now watch this. So in Romans 5, Romans 12, 5, it says, So we, being many, as one body in Christ and individually members of one another, having then gifts, uh, underline that, having then what? Okay. Now, these are the only gifts you have. Okay? Because in, in 1 Corinthians 12, it talks about gifts of the Spirit. Okay? So he has those nine gifts, but you have the Spirit. So in a way, you have those gifts. But, okay, but these in Romans 12 are the only ones you'll see that you have. Okay, so he starts off, he says, having then gifts differing according to the grace that's given to us, let us use them. Okay, look at your neighbor say, let us use them. <laughs> okay, so he starts off, he says, if prophecy, let us prophesy according to our proportion of faith, right? Or ministry, let us use it in our ministry. He that teaches in teaching. He that exhorts in exhortation. He that gives with liberality. He that leads with diligence. He that shows mercy with cheerfulness. Right? Then in verse 9 it says, Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Okay. But so here he names several gifts that are given that are in everybody in this room. Every single one of you in this room has one of these gifts in Romans 12. God says you have those gifts. My number one gift that I function by is the gift of exhortation. Okay? So everything functions in my life out of that gift. That's my number one gifting. I know that. Okay? So that's, that's my passion. That's my heart. Okay? So I love to exhort and build someone up because that's everything kind of flows out of that <laughs> fire hose. Okay? So out of that fire hose, or so to speak, or out of that, that's where I minister to people, you know, whether it's as an evangelist or as a prophet or whatever it might be, I, I minister out of that, okay? Now, yours may be different, you know. I, I personally think Pastor Curry has a great gift of leading. That's a great gift, okay? That's his most dominant gifting. That's what I would say. Now, he may say one of the other ones, but I don't know. But and, and all of you in here, you have to look through here like, oh, wow, which one is kind of draws and catches my attention the most? And guess what? That's the one that you are, is your most dominant gifting, right? Now, I only met you a little bit, but I could tell that you have the gift of mercy. That's your greatest gift. You always flow. He's got a mercy gift, right? And uh, people that don't even deserve it, he'll give it to them, right? And so that's his most dominant gift, right? Is that right, Pastor? Is that about right? Yeah. Okay. His congregation is like, yep, yep. Okay. So, but, and so then you find out, you know, kind of what is, what is uh, the number one thing? What is my number one propelling gift 
that I flow in the Spirit from and function in the Spirit from, and it makes it easier for you to understand how God will speak to you that way. Okay? And I'm more of an extrovert, and so um, as an, you know, more of an extrovert, this is kind of how God speaks to me, and so I will have to provoke myself often in different ways than you might have, have to, right? And so, but I, I say all that for this reason is this, is that the moment you begin to get the revelation of, hey, this is where my most dominant gifting is. And if I begin to get the revelation of, ah, this is where I function from. This is my functioning gift. And so from here, we'll spring out all of these other things other gifts of the Spirit will begin to function out of it, but it will all have the smell <laughs> or the aroma of the main gift. Come on, right? And so once you have that revelation, you're like, ah, I understand. So if God speaks to you, there's a certain, there's a certain way that he'll minister to you and through you. Like I would say, Pastor Vitali, I would say probably your most dominant gift is your giving gift. You have a giving, you have the gift of giving, like it talks about here. And it's not talking about mo just monetarily, it's just talking about everything. Giving this away and his greatest joy comes by giving, right? And so, um, yeah, so all of these things begin to function. But I want you to catch this because it will all begin to click and make sense in hearing the voice of God and letting God begin to use you in ministering to people. Come on, somebody, right? But the one thing I noticed is this, is at least for myself, is if I wait continuously for the Spirit, nothing happens. Right? So there's something about me purposely um, um, making time to minister to people. I have to force myself to do it. Okay? I'm talking about outside of a church setting. You understand? And so uh, many people are like, well, if the occasion arises, then I'll do it. And, and then they get frustrated because God's not using them very much. Well, the reason is, is because you need to schedule it just like you need to schedule your devotional time. Come on, right? How many of you ever noticed that if you try to, you know, actually have time to pray, you never have time to pray? You ever notice that? Or read the word, right? There's never time. So you have to force it and make time, right? Guess what? The same thing is true regarding outreach, right? And so outreach occurs, and you be actually begin to hear better. Because this is what the Lord said to me years ago. Is, 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 uh, he said, how many ears in proportions to mouths do you have? I said, two to one. Then he said, you should do twice as much listening as talking. So it's a mindset change, right? So all of a sudden now we're just, we're hearing and being obedient in it. Not just, he's not Santa Claus where I come with my list. <laughs> There's my list, God. Fulfill my list. No, God says this. Listen, just trust me in those individual areas and ask me to speak to you about them. Right? Now when you leave this place and you go to Walmart or you go to what, whatever, is it Fred Myers? Is that the name of it? Yeah. Okay, we don't have that, so I walked in. I'm like, is this a grocery store or a clothing store? I'm like, what the heck is this? Okay, and uh, okay, so you go into places, wherever it is that you're going, going to the gas station, whatever, begin to purpose. Okay, I'm going to take time. I am going to do something. I'm going to stretch my spirit man, right? I'm going to give this guy a word of knowledge, right? Remember, I was ministering in, in Oakdale, okay? And so in California, you know Oakdale, ah, oh, okay. So I, I used to pastor in Modesto. So, uh, <laughs> so I used to be a pastor there. So I was ministering in Oakdale. This is about six, seven years ago. And uh, so as I was in the city of Oakdale, I went and I was driving, and I just said, "All right, Lord, I'm going to give the next gas station. I'm going to give that guy a word of knowledge." All right? And, and as I'm driving, I got hit with the strongest desire to have, uh, uh, what do they call that, uh, tea, uh, raspberry tea, right? 
So all of a sudden, man, I just had to have a raspberry tea. I love those things. Jesus. Right? So I don't drink them very often, but I'm like, man, I just want a raspberry tea. So I pull into the gas station, and I go in, and as I walk in, um, I said, do you guys have raspberry tea? The guy says, nope, we don't have it, but the gas station across the street does. So I drive across the street. I go into the gas station. I'm like, you guys got raspberry iced tea? And the guy says, yeah, right over there. So I go over, I grab the raspberry iced tea, and as soon as I just turn around, remember I was talking this morning about people standing out to you? It was like this dude's shoulder stood out, his right shoulder stood out to me, okay? So this guy is from Pakistan. He's a Muslim guy. He's not a Christian guy. And so I said, I got to ask you a crazy question. He said, go for it. I said, is something wrong with your right shoulder? He says, how do you know that? (laughs) Kind of takes a step back. I said, because, I said, I believe in God, and I believe God can talk today. Do you believe God can talk today? He goes, yeah. (laughs) And I said, said, watch this. And so I I always learned that it's easier to get forgiveness than permission. (laughs) So I just reached over. I said, in the name of Jesus, all pain, go. Took my hand off, and I said, lift it. And so he all of a sudden, he lifts it. He's like, Holy cow. Would that work on my ankle as well? He's like, that was cool. And he's saying something in, in, you know, in Arabic. I don't know what he was saying, but I, I assume it was cursing. You know, it's like, holy cow, this thing is, I, he had no pain. He was so shocked. And so then I went and I prayed for his ankle and he was healed. He was just kind of staring at me at like backing off and stuff. And I said, see, Jesus loves you so much. He wanted to minister to you right here today, even with me getting a raspberry iced tea. Right? But see, the Spirit was leading me in that. The moment I put the Spirit to the test, He was readily available. And that's why I had the desire for the raspberry iced tea. Because the guy across the street wasn't ready. Come on, right? I mean, think about it. Just think about, just for a minute, why is it out of nowhere you have a desire for whatever, Thai food? (laughs) You know, we went to Thai food today, right? Or Vietnamese food, right? Or why is it out of nowhere you have a desire for Dairy Queen? Or why is it out of nowhere you... Because God uses those natural things in you to trigger you toward the Spirit. Come on, somebody. And so God is communicating, and as he is so doing, he's trying to activate the church to walk in the supernatural and hear his voice. Amen? Amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, bless you guys.